what did you see or what did you learn different about yourself in the Afros in the sense that you were actually really in a group that was putting out an album again after being not like I was curious too. Davy D Davy's ride was just Davy D on it, even though you're on the cover, of course. But now the Afros, you're like in the group per se. How did that uh, affect you business wise, creatively, personally, if at all? I don't know if it affected me in a at all, really, because by then I had already knew that I was gonna be on records. I already knew that it was destined for me to record and make songs. I had already knew all of this. So, you know, when I, you know, and 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 um when the Afros thing came about, it was like, yo, your turn. You know, how you wanna do it now? It's your turn. You know, and I had been waiting on my turn, like I told you, uh, for years. So it's your turn, you know, let's go step up to the plate. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So then going on tour with the Beastie Boys uh, after the Afros, <clears throat> at this point they were going, or they had already gone through in a big change stylistically and creatively, and you had been around them all these years. So what did you see differently? Like what made them change so much from License to Ill and Paul's Boutique and Check Your Head and all these things, why were they having this big change, would you say? I think it just has to do with probably just getting older and wiser. Um, because the license the ill tour and together the ever tour was so wild that it kind of burns you out, you know? And, and I guess they look back on it and it's like, man, we can't do that again. Like, we kill ourselves out here. You know, the crazy stuff they was doing back then, it was crazy. We had cell phones back then with cameras. It wouldn't be a good look at all. Trust me, it wouldn't be a good look at all. Things was crazy. So I think, you know, the change just came with age and um, getting wiser and making better decisions as an individual, as a group, you know, to make the right decisions, period. I mean, I don't know how to explain it. Okay. Better than that, you know? I mean, for me, you know, I was knocking guys out, raising hell tour, license the hell tour, together the hell tour. I, I was good with my hands, something jumped off, boom, 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 get hurricane. Okay, boom, 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 boom. That's why I was shaking rump. They say, hurricane, put your head out. I was putting heads out. I was the new, I would, just straight up, let me just shut it down right now. And, you know, as I got older, as they got older, everybody just calmed down a little bit. Well, it seems like that was a good thing then. <clears throat> yeah. So with the Shadrach, given that that video had, it was animated, but it also had a very different style of animation, at least to me, especially also in the rap video world. Right. What was your reaction when you were first seeing it and, and how that affected how the groups perceived, would you say? You know, the dope thing about the Shadrach video is all live. The scratches is live, the vocals is live, everything is live. So it wasn't, uh, you know, pre recorded, it was just live. They recorded everything live and the cameras and all that. And at the time when we were doing it, I knew we were doing it live. You hear my scratches. Eh, eh, so I'm scratching, and I know we're shooting a video, but I'm not knowing that they're going to animate this video. So when I first seen it, the first rough cut that I seen, and I'm looking at it, I'm like, man, this looks kind of weird, though. You know, it's animated, but it kind of looks painted. You know, I'm still kind of like, I don't know if people's going to get it. You know what I mean? Like, it's maybe a little bit too advanced for some of these people out here. And then when I got the finish edit, I was like, yo, by then I was like, I like this. This is totally different than anything else that's out there. And then I said, but are they going to get it? You know, are they going to understand what this is? And um, they dropped it. And 
it's crazy dope it's to this day that video is crazy everything you see with the the stage diving and the pit and flowing around and the scratches and the vocals, all that's live. That's crazy. Because mm -hmm. I think when that came out, it was obviously very innovative, but it also, beyond being innovative, it was, at least again, to me, unlike anything I had seen and the song, because at that point we were getting, uh, in my opinion, unfortunately, away from a lot of scratching and stuff on records. Mm -hmm. It was just so, uh, it was just crazy. And, and the movement of it too, because uh, the whole thing had, was sliding to the side and up and down and all that stuff. It, to me, it was very uh, innovative and distinctive. And I always thought that video, and since you're in it, of course, <laughs> I was just like, man, very, uh, very creative. Um, yeah. yeah. So at this point, and as things go on and, and Grand Royal really gets up and running, and of course the Hurra comes a few years after this, but as you're touring and as they're doing Check Your Head and getting further and further away from License to Ill and maturing and changing and all these different things, um, there were so many people around and, and we see on the records like Amario C, yourself. So what was your role would you say or your input creatively musically if at all with the beastie boys in the early 90s um i would probably say uh that um definitely when you hear hear these guys flowing finger licking good which i co-wrote um the hook on that i used to always do a lot of freestyle raps around the guys and say certain words and do certain certain things and when i would hear them rap i would see some of my style as far as words that would come out on their lyrics um so i was i was, I was definitely plugged in when it comes down to that um um, musically, those guys have always been incredible with finding beats. You know, I can't take any credit for them, the way they find their beats. I, I I would go record shopping with them just to see, you know, I, I know about a lot of records, but you don't know everything. You know what I mean? So, like, they introduced me to Dr. John um, music. I wasn't too familiar with Dr. John. Jeremy Steed which was the loop for uh, Sure Shot, the flute player. Um, I wound up buying all his, all the Jeremy Steed records and finding different stuff on the stuff. You know, that's from being around them. And um, so I think we both kind of taught each other different things. You know, I can say I definitely taught them how to flow better on the live show. Because it, it, it was times when I would DJ and the way they flow one, two, three with each other, if 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 Mike starts his rap off beat, they will stay off beat. Like nobody would come back on, and I would grab the mic and say where they need to come back in at. If you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll be up to DJ and somebody will start off wrong, and then the next dude will come in. And start off wrong, and the next one will be start off wrong, and they're off beat, and they keep going, and they kind of looking at each other like, okay, it's off, but what do we do? But me with my DJ and MC senses, I'm hearing it in my head, and I say it on the mic real loud, and then they'll come in. Perfect example was a uh, it was an MTV show, <clears throat> and it was Sure Shot. And um, I think it was MCA, it's on video. I think it was MCA, he came off, he came on wrong and everybody was off. And then I got on the mic and brought everybody on. So it was just, you know, one hand washes the other pretty much. Yeah, cause they, uh, that, that's incredible because their style and they for so long were able to really just exist in this lane i think by themselves uh yeah they were pretty much the treacherous three what do you mean 
you know, the one, two, three rappers, like, you know, Flow one, two, like the trench was three. You know, Mike D even said it during the uh, Hall of Fame induction. He's like, yo, shout out to the Treacherous Three, you know? You mean as far as like the tag team style or how they yeah, did? Yeah, of course, yeah, the tag team style. And of course they learned a lot of stuff from Run DMC as well. So, you know, everybody learns something from somebody. Right. If that was before you or that you looked at, you know? Yeah, and they- scratches, Some of my scratches I learned from Davey D. When you hear, <laughs> you know, I got that from Davey. Yeah, everybody's got to learn from something. Yeah, absolutely. And someone, which is, you know, how the game, how a game is supposed to be. So with, with the Hurra coming out on Grand Royal, this is the Beastie Boys label. Um, did they approach you? You came to them? Like, what happened? Well, during the... Uh... Uh, check your head tour. You know, I'm always rapping, sound check, doing the show. These guys know I'm I'm dope on the mic, coming up with hooks and routines, doing the show. And Grand Royal, you got their deal. And um, me and Mike was having a conversation, and I was like, Yo, Mike, I, you know, I need to do my own solo record. I've been wanting to do my own solo record for a minute. Basically, and you know, you guys got this deal. We got the studio, Grand Royal well, Studio G, son. You know, let's do it. You know, I was like, okay, cool. And Mario C was like, yo, Kane's fucking dope. Kane needs to do his own record. It's fucking dope. You know what I'm saying? So, me and Mario went to the studio. Didn't take us long to record the album either, man. We busted out in no time. We got it done, you know. And that was the record that I always wanted to do since records was getting made in hip hop. It's just that I was getting turned this way and turned that way to help this and do that. And then finally that just landed where it landed. And I had already had some lyrics written and I was ready to go. Okay. And what, uh, with Mario C, given that you had had so much exposure with the DVDs, the Jam Master J's, et cetera. What was it like creatively getting into a different circle uh, officially with the Hura? It was incredible, man. Um, you know, working with Mario, we really worked good together on that record. Um, at first, I didn't know how we would work together um, because his style was a little different than my style. But when we got together, we kind of just did both styles together and we came up with some dope ideas um, to make this record. So, you know, I'm glad I worked with Mario on that record because he brought out a different style of me than what I would have brought out, just me working on it myself, you know? So, um, came out pretty good. Be sure to check out the History of Gangsta Rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of Gangsta Rap features exclusive interviews with Ice-T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The History of Gangsta Rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip-hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, five on your TV back for that WA? Yo MTV, it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.